Hey everyone, I'm the Earth 1999 or Drew, and I'm the host of the Enter the Dungeon D&D podcast. And today I want to tell you the story of one of our campaign arcs, where the players were searching for a water temple in order to potentially inspire some of your own D&D quests, and also to share some of the resources that we use. Hey, so I've got to say this when I was first recording this story, but the overall focus of this campaign is a giant relic hunt for items known as the Planar Gems. These are very powerful magic items in this game world, and each one is tied to a different plane of existence. So, for instance, there might be, you know, a gem of fire, a gem of the celestial plane, gem of the nine hells, etc., etc., and right now they are searching for a water gem from the water temple. Anyway, back to the story. To set the scene, there are three players in this campaign as of the time of this story. There is Earthmover, a Goliath who has a homebrew class based off of Fullmetal Alchemist. I've got a video on that actually, talking more about that. There's a halfling monk named Thitch who also multiclassed into being a Raven Queen Warlock. And lastly, there is a sorcerer named Gerald who also multiclassed as a Great Old One Warlock. Um, he actually was not in the very beginning of this story, but he'll get there in a minute. So, in order to search for this water temple, they needed a boat. So they went to a duke of a kingdom that they were visiting, and he had kind of heard of their reputation of all their adventures, so he'd already sort of taken a liking to them. He just wanted them to do something for him first. So he sent them on a quest to pick up a delinquent tax payment from a nearby village. We don't really have time to go into details of that story, but the important thing is that they did it, they got the money, they gave it to the Duke, and the Duke gifted them a boat. And once the official announcement of the boat giving had been made, a portal opened up and Gerald walked back in. His player had had to leave the campaign for about a year because he was joining the Marines, he had basic training and everything like that, but once he was settled in, he was able to rejoin the game, so it was really nice to have him back. So they had their boat and they started sailing. So the way I did this was that I gave the players a seed chart that had about 64 boxes on it. They started off in one box and then each basically nautical round, which lasted one hour, they could choose which nearby box to go to. And then I had my master copy of the seed chart that explained what would be in each square. So they started sailing off. And the first thing that they encounter is, you know, this seemingly ghost ship with zombies on it. Then they see a pot of dolphins get eaten by a shark, and then that shark was eaten by an even larger shark, and that shark started to chase them. I should explain that the party already has two planar gems at this point. One of them is the gem of Thanatos, which the monk has, and then the other is the earth gem, which, as you can imagine, earth mover has. And Thitch used the gem of Thanatos to cast the darkness spell over the shark's eyes, right after Earthmover had used his alchemy to basically conjure a bunch of water directly into the shark's scales to kind of overwhelm it and make it choke a bit, and that gave them enough leeway to be able to escape. And while they're sailing about, um, Earthmover also realized, hey, that since he has the gust of wind spell, he can sort of cast that into the sails to make them move even faster. Uh, they run into some giant snakes, which they are able to evade, but since the snakes were blocking the path that they were going, they had to redirect and start going upwards instead of continuing in a straight line. And they end up sailing around until they end up in a flat calm, where they would need to expend some of their own resources in order to move the boat again. And with some efforts, they make it to what they like to call Coconut Island. This is a abandoned or perhaps never discovered island that just has a few coconut trees growing on it. They made camp there for the night, and they decided that they would basically just sort of lay their own claim to it. Earthmover used some of his alchemy to build an impromptu shelter, and they have said that they'll come back there again when they get the chance. And this might just be their secretive base of operation out on the seas. Then after that, they started sailing again. Uh, they saw a magic rainbow and went into a storm. The storm knocked the boat around back <laughs> into the flat calm, so they had to move themselves out of that again. And then they ended up in the middle of a pirate duel. So, this pirate showdown was actually between two people that they already knew, one of whom was a pirate captain named the Phantom, who they were sort of already friends with and worked with in the past, and then the other one was this Aarakocra pirate that had attacked a ship that they were sailing on. 
So I think it's clear <laughs> which side they took on that fight. And Fitch, during the battle, he jumped off of his own ship onto the Aarakocra ship, went down underneath to the bottom, and then just started using the Thanatos gem as well as his punching powers to rot through the wood and start making a hole in the ship so that it would sink. He did this because last time he fought this Aarakocra woman, he jumped onto her boat and threw all of her food reserves out. So, yeah, I guess, you know, if they ever see her again, they're just going to keep on destroying all her ships. And also potentially killing the entire crew, because that's one way to deal with your problems. But the Phantom was grateful for their help, and so he gave them a spyglass as a reward, which I ruled that pretty much once per nautical round, they could use it to look at a nearby square to see what might be there to help them avoid some dangers. After that, they ended up in an area that was filled with explosive platforms that they were mostly able to navigate around, although I do remember Gerald had to basically just blow one up using Fireball before it could reach the ship, but that was a close call. And shortly after that, they made it to the temple. So, uh, part of this temple's design was a lot like Wang Shitong's spirit library, so they just saw this giant spire in the middle of the ocean on a stone island, and when they got out to investigate, they realized that it was just kind of a continuous surface of this stone island to the spire, and they figured, oh hey, this must be the temple, and the entire thing was sunken. So they climbed all the way up to the tower, and then lowered themselves in. And once they were in there, they actually found in the very first chamber that there was a group of Sahuagans who were sacrificing a fish. Now the thing is, they don't speak Sahuagan, so they don't really know what this ritual was about, but Gerald pretty much used his magic to just vaporize the Sahuagin leader on, like, the second turn of combat. And this made the remaining Sahuagin think that he must be some kind of divine figure. And so, <laughs> Gerald, using a combination of his great old one telepathy abilities and the Comprehend Languages spell, starts communicating to the Sahuagin that he is, in fact, a god, and that he's chosen them in particular to follow them through this dungeon. So they went along with them, and then they went down to the next layer. And so the way this entire uh, temple was set up is that, you know, there would be a hall with a magic room, they would have to do something in the room, then go down to the next layer, and so on and so forth. But with this first layer, it was actually just a doorway to what's known as the Sigil Wheel Inn. So in my campaign world, this is a magical in-between the worlds of sorts, that's run by an unknown mysterious entity that seems to have taken an interest in providing accommodation to adventurers. Each one is run by a Ralph, pretty much the name of the hotel manager is always Ralph, no matter the species or gender or anything. And Ralph's, well, here's what they know about them. They seem to have a connection to a very powerful network of other Ralphs, and they can speak all languages, and probably are pretty powerful within themselves, but they've never tried to pick a fight with a Ralph, so that's good. So far, this is their second time running into a Sigil Wheel Inn. So this particular Ralph, he was in the form of a fishman, and he greeted the uh, party and explained to them that this entire temple was built as a challenge to protect a treasure at the bottom level, and that every 24 hour, pretty much all of the traps and puzzles reset, so they have until then to clear the temple. I did it this way so that way, you know, the players, they couldn't, like, do one layer, go up to the sigil wheel and get a long rest, do another layer, get a long rest. They would have to do it all in one continuous go with maybe a few short rests along the way. And so they spent the night at the sigil wheel inn so that they could get, you know, a clean start early in the morning. But before they did, Gerald took the Sahuagin out into the main temple with him, and he got them to pretty much just... Um, swear fealty to him, and so I let them take pretty much a level of paladin each, so that they would have, you know, these paladin fishmen accompanying them and helping them fight the challenges of the temple. And so the first challenge that they went to is actually a puzzle in the library. So, to be honest, this particular puzzle maybe didn't need a you know, game map per se, but I included it just to sort of, you know, get them used to the idea that we would be using a lot of game maps for this particular campaign arc. And the way the puzzle here worked is that there was a weight-based elevator where 
they would need to stack up enough counterweight on one side and then get on the other. If there was too much counterweight, then the elevator wouldn't go anywhere, but if there was too little, then they would slam down too quickly and have to take fall damage. And since, you know, the only available weight there was the books, they had to guess how much each book weighed based off of how much their characters weighed. I think they only, only were able to get an accurate counterbalance for the Sahuwagen. The rest of them took fall damage, except, you know, the monk, when he took his, he was just able to use his monk's slow fall abilities to cancel it out. Then after that, they went down to the next layer, where they saw that the... Stairway that led down further was flooded, but that there was a door on the other end. When they opened up that doorway, they saw that it was actually a gate to an Arctic world where there was a bunch of snowmen, and a sign telling them that they needed to look for the treasure within the snowmen. And so pretty much this was a puzzle where they had to figure out which snowmen to break into, because if they broke into the wrong ones, then they would take damage as the snowmen attacked them. And so the solution to this puzzle ended up being that they had to see which snowmen were all facing each other, and then go from there in order to get golden orbs. And once they had all three orbs, they took them out, went back to the flood staircase, put the orbs in the staircase, and it drained away, unveiling the next level. And that was pretty much how the temple would work from then on. They would have to go through several more challenges to get gold orbs in order to drain the water down to the next layer, and this doorway now leads out to a swamp area. And after exploring the swamp, they found that there were these two ogres ready there to challenge them. And so, this was the battle map we used. So the, so the dark gray, that was just normal dirt that they could walk on. There were bushes on either side that they would take damage if they walked through. Then there was the light brown on the sides. That was just mud. That was difficult terrain. Just clean water on the ends, mostly just for the aesthetic. There was the trolls towards the... There was the ogres towards the back there. And there was there was towers that would shoot out poisonous gas each round. And then there was two bullywogs hidden in the mud that would jump out to attack them. This was you know, a really fun battle to play around with. You know, them having to figure out where they need to stand to avoid the poison... And what they realized after the first few rounds was that the poison was healing the ogres when they breathed it in, so they needed to take care of these guys quickly before it became too much of a runaway problem. But after a while, they were able to uh, win the battle. Actually, I remember for the finishing blow, Earthmover was basically just using his alchemy to make fire damage against one of the trolls, and since I knew that it would be enough to... Um, kill him anyway, I just sort of um, described the effect as that fire going up the moment that the gases were emitted, and those gases also just so happened to be flammable, so this ogre just breathed in a mouthful of fire and it killed it from the inside. After that, they were able to collect a gold orb from where the ogres were before, put it in the water, drained, and it went down to the next layer. Then they went into a, another one of these magical rooms. This one appeared to be a laboratory of some kind, but all that was remaining in it was six large vats of acid and at the bottom of each vat of acid was a key and they needed all six keys to open up the chest that contained the next orb and so they needed to figure out a way to get the acid um gerald brute forced a couple of these by just reaching in to grab it earth mover actually blew one up and then had stitch use mage hand to get it from the acid pile um Thich used his warlock magic to um, ritual summon an unseen servant that appeared pretty much in the acid and its summoning motion pushed the key upwards which Stitch was immediately able to grab but you know since it's an unseen servant as soon as it took the damage it disappeared so that was fun and honestly even if you don't use any of the rest of this I, I would really like to see more people do this acid puzzle because I just want to see what solutions your players are able to come up with after that they were able to use the keys open up the chest go down to the next layer and this time the next door opened up to what i guess can be best described as a hangar because there was a ship waiting for them there that they need to fly and use it to fight a storm or a wind elemental technically but a storm and then this was all explained to them by the ghostly apparition of a halfling that appeared before them who simply called himself the architect he said that he was glad to see challengers 
make it so far again. And he told them that after they defeated this challenge, then they would have to face the shield guardian one layer below. So they got up into the airship and they went against that <laughs> air elemental and its small army of <laughs> methods. Pretty much a method is just a um, low level elemental creature. They come in all sorts of different varieties like mud, fire, steam, smoke, etc. They're really fun to play with because they fit in so many different contexts. So they're one of my favorite low level monsters just to sprinkle into any fight. Now this ship that they were using, they realized that there were a few weapons on it, including some crossbows that the Salhuagin soldiers, who, by the way, their names were Chip and Dale. <coughs> so yeah, Chip and Dale, they were able to use some uh, crossbows to fight off the methods. And Thitch, his primary interest was the cannon mounted at the front of the ship. He made sure to get that cannon loaded as much as he could and just kept firing it at the air elemental. And that ended up doing the critical hit. So the way cannons work in D&D is that it takes three actions to use them. You need one action to load, one action to aim, and one action to fire. And the fire action is the actual attack roll. And so Thitch made his attack roll, got a nat 20, double cannon damage, just annihilated the thing. <laughs> and with that, the architect cleared the water for them so that they were able to go down and face the shield guardian. Now the shield guardian fight was... Personally, I think it was my favorite boss battle that I've ever run, simply because of the way I was able to get so many elements going in it. Honestly, I may have overdone it a little bit, because you see on these platforms, there's two skeletons per platform, and then at the center platform, there's a shield guardian holding a staff with the water gem in it, and then there's a bunch of sharks swimming around. The whole fight ended up taking us about four hours total, probably dragged in a couple places, but it was definitely really fun to do. Um, Earth Mover, he ended up using his alchemy to make bridges to uh, more of the platforms. Thitch used his monastic, um, you know, speed and jumping to get over from one to another. And <laughs> Gerald, his goal was to try to get that water staff away from the shield guardian. And so... <laughs> So to make this fight easier on myself, I basically broke it up into three main rounds. Round one was when they first entered, and at that point it was just going to be the skeletons that engaged them, shooting their arrows and everything. Round two was when they ended up on the inner ring. That would activate the shield guardian, so he would stop, start to fight them. And then round three was once they had the um, staff from the shield guardian. That would activate the sharks, so when they started jumping over platforms, the sharks responded with opportunity attacks to jump out of the water and bite them. After a while, Stitch decided to dedicate himself to being the one who went around knocking out the skeletons. Since, you know, they're just skeletons, they have very low HP and armor class. The idea was that they were pretty much just turrets there to sort of, you know, complement the station largely stationary creature in the middle, and that they could just do a little bit of damage each round. Fitch then remembered that he had the Inflict Wound spell, which... Hey, um, actually, when I was editing, I realized I accidentally said Inflict Wounds here when I meant to say the Chill Touch. That's a cantrip that Thitch learned when he multiclassed the Warlock. But on the other hand, the other Sorcerer Warlock, Gerald, he knows the spell Inflict Wounds, and he actually uses it a lot to disintegrate people. It's one of his favorite spells. Since he's a monk, the way he flavors that is rather it being a finger that reaches out to attack you, it's a fist that flies out towards you. So he was able to use that to knock out a, you know, few skeletons per round when he, you know, varied between his martial arts or his spell casting, depending on what the situation required. Eventually, though, Geralt was able to arrest the staff from the uh, shield guardian's hand, and Earth Mover was able to use his alchemy to just pin him to the ground by making the ground come up around him. Uh, he was eventually able to break out of that, so uh, Thitch tried pushing him into the water, but he was eventually able to climb out of the water. In order to block the volley of arrows that were coming towards them while they were fighting at the center of the map, Earthmover thought to, you know, just raise up the waters and make an ice wall using his alchemy. Eventually they realized, wait a minute, why are we still fighting this creature? We have what we want. We came here for the artifact. We get no benefit by killing it. Let's just leave. And leave they did. <laughs> Gerald figured out how the uh, shield guardian was using the staff to move around the platform, so he used that to his advantage to move forward. 
by getting their platform away from him, and they were able to escape. After their escape, they met back up with the architect, who told them that he was very impressed with the way that they were able to handle things and congratulated them on their new treasure. Gerald took the water gem off of its existing staff and put it on his own magic staff to combine their powers, and as a reward for their hard work, Earthmover and Thitch both received the blessing of the temple's goddess, which pretty much will be a one-use effect that can let them breathe underwater whenever they want to activate that. Haven't used it yet, but maybe they will. And so, that's pretty much the main story of the stone movers, as they call their party, since they're looking for you know the magical gemstones of the planar gems. Exploring the waters around a water temple, getting inside of it, and then fighting their way through. Uh, if you're interested in using any of the battle maps or the C chart that I showed here, I'll link to those below. This was honestly just a really fun campaign arc to play in. If I were to do it again, like I said, probably would have simplified the boss battle a little bit. That ended up having too many elements, but like the way that worked. And for me, it was a great case study in, you know, being able to use a lot of battle maps and handouts and everything for the campaign. If you're interested in learning more about my advice on using battle maps and handouts, I actually just put out another video talking about that, so hope you'll check that out. Till next time, I've been the Aries 1999. Hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day, and God bless.